Hi, I'm Tim, and welcome to Creator Conversations. The internet is full of innuendo, rumor, and secondhand wisdom. But when you want a straight answer, it pays to go straight to the source. Today, I welcome Matthew Haberlin, General Manager and Partner, Ulysse Nardin. Welcome. Thank you so much, Matthew. An honor to be here, Tim. So let's start with the beginning, which is not finance or management or equity. It's all about watches. You were a collector before you were part of UN. You were a collector probably before you were even an adult. Where did it start? You know, I'm not coming from a watch background. Um, my mother, she was a social worker. My uh, father was um, a uh, mechanics in planes and, and lately became a pilot. So nothing to do with watches. <clears throat> and I remember I was, I believe 15, I was in Paris, um, walking in Rue Madame uh, in the sixth district of Paris. And at some point I kind of stopped by a shop window and you had beautiful vintage timepieces. And you know, uh, I was not the typical customer. I was, you know, 15, uh, baggy jeans, sneakers, a cap, but I decided to enter the shop. And I think I left one hour or one hour and a half after that. Engage with a watchmaker, um, you know, obviously a salesman, and they really fueled the watchmaking passion to me. I think the discussion at the time was about Breguet Tab 20, 21, you know, the watch that were produced before Second World War, the one after. And yes, I mean, I left that shop with, with a passion. And I think from that day, I read magazines. Um, I think I believe I knew the name of all the executive, all the CEOs. And, and I had to buy my first, you know, luxury watch, true mechanical watch. And, um, and the watch that I was really dreaming of was a Submariner no date. So obviously I didn't have the money. So I saved every single euro I could to basically one day afford that watch. And, um, and I went through watching at, you know, Omega Seamasters, some tag also, and I was always that close to buy, but I always had in my mind a Submariner, you know, and I said, you know, you better keep saving. And to the point where um, I was 18, so I saved for three years. And um, I think it was the name of the website was kind of a time of Switzerland. It was an Australian website. And, uh, and the, the, Current uh, currency exchange was quite good and in favor of, of euro compared to Australian dollar. And I think I, I paid online for a pre-owned uh, sub no date. And uh, I didn't know if I was about to receive the watch. And I remember I received in, in one shipment the box and paper on another one, the watch. And, and here I was having my sub at 18 and I was all over the place. Uh, you did better than I did. I dreamed of the Submariner. I wound up with a Seamaster, which is also good. But it's yeah. always great to see the grail attained. Uh, what other watches do you collect? Do you have any other milestone watches that stand out in your collection? Yes, look, I've, I've, got, I've got quite a few. I've got, obviously, my very first uh, Swatch uh, that, I, was, you know, that I, I got from my parents when I was 10. I think I was also at some point dreaming of a Portuguese chrono from my WDC, and I ended up buying... Um, I think it was a Hugo Boss with kind of calendar function that looks like the chronograph, you know, counters. Oh, yeah, and, yeah. Um, and, and, and I went for it. I just love that watch. Um, I mean, I've got all sorts of things. I've, I've got also a, I'm, I'm, I'm close to Mohamed Siddiqui uh, from the Siddiqui family and he created his own watch brand, Vintage. I think I'm probably one of his first customers. So I, I, bought, a, I bought a few from him. I've got what, what, what do I, have? I think I wanted to treat myself when my daughter was born, my second child, and I went for my um, for Daytona, uh, which I, I absolutely love. Um, and I think the milestone piece was um, actually not so long ago. I was uh, when I was a, a rep for Yegolo Cult in, uh, in the UK, that was my second job from 2011 to 2014. Uh, Patek Philippe was fairly distributed in the UK. So I'm, I'm French, and I think in, in France, you had at that time only two, two boutiques, two, two IDs. You had Vempe at that time, selling in France uh, Patek Philippe, and you had the, the Patek Philippe Salon on Place Vendôme. In the UK, you had 35 or 40 point of sales. 
And when I was, you know, representing and going to the ADs for Yego Le Cult, pretty much all the time, I saw Patek Philippe in the windows. And at that time, the watch that they were promoting was the, I, I believe, 5960, so the annual calendar chrono. I think it was mainly the white gold with like a blue dial uh, on, on a brown strap. And I really loved the design and, and kind of a mono counter, you know, display oh, yes. for, for the chronograph. The bullseye. Yes, absolutely love that. And, and I think down the line, I, I always had that watch in my mind. And I realized that they've done it in a steel version afterwards, uh, one also on, on bracelets. And actually, I think it was like maybe a couple of months ago, I was in Hong Kong and I was, you know, checking what was, you know, on the, on the, on the pre-owned markets. And I just realized that one was available in Hong Kong. So I went to, I texted the guy, we, we, we got kind of in contact, he's a collector too. I think it was on a, on, a, on a Wednesday, I met with him, he had a watch, we had a coffee, and I said, look, I'm ready to take the watch, it's, it's beautiful, I'm ready to go for it, but I need to make the money transfer, right? So it's gonna take 48 hours, and I'm going to Macau the day after that, and, at the, and on Friday I will return to Hong Kong, so, um, we can put the watch if you want in the safe, the UN safe, because we have a, an office for Hulis Nana in Hong Kong, and, and while the money being transferred. And he said to me, no, just leave with the watch. I said, are you kidding me? I would not do that, but he just did. So I think that sh the, the buying experience was quite unique. It's really the first time that I bought a watch from, from a collector. And, um, and I think, yes, that's probably my, my highlight from, from my collection. Well, of course, prior to you lease Narden. Now, you are part of the company. You are part of the management group that purchased the company in 2022. So you're also a partner. You're the managing director. So a lot of people understand what a CEO or a CTO or a COO does. What does the managing director do? What is your role within the company today? So we we exiting from carrying and, and buying out. Uh, Ulysse Nana and Joao Perego, we, we formed, we created a, a mother company, a small group called SoWIND, S-O-W-I-N-D. And SoWIND basically owns UN and GP. <clears throat> so we've got um, shared function, um, such as finance, HR, um, um, so the, the, the COO, CFO, and the chief industrial officer, report to the CEO and chairman of the group, Patrick Prigno. And, um, and he created actually lately, so uh, it's, it's, a, it's a month old, for you and the role of managing director, um, basically managing everything related to the brand. So sales, distribution, uh, product development, product marketing, uh, marketing, communication, uh, that's now all, all on me. Now, we'll uh, jump to differentiation of the brands because you do have the two brands in-house with GP and UN. But let's talk a little bit about the separation from caring and how that came about. Now, my understanding is that there was no ill will or bad feelings, but both sides, uh, management and caring itself, had agreed to part company. How did those discussions advance? And uh, essentially... Am I right that you parted on good terms or was there more to it than that? No, no, we, we did. Look, I mean, um, first of all, I'm very thankful about caring because they gave me the opportunity at the age of 30 to basically run uh, UN for the sales and distribution. You know, it's not something that I was expecting. And I obviously like the challenge being quite competitive. And I have also an entrepreneurship mindset. Um, and um, and so, so thankful, thankful for that. And then I believe we always managed to be fairly independent and, and autonomous within the caring group. Because if you think about it, they've got Gucci, uh, Bottega Veneta, Balenciaga, Saint Laurent, you know, like big names. Uh, Puma, things like that. Puma, and, and, and they've got UNNGP. Uh, on one side, distribution of, of big brands, mega brands. On the other side, manufacturing of, of much more companies. So I think they, 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 they did a good job trying to integrate as much as possible the two brands while creating as much autonomy. And I think at the end, you know, I think they, it, it's kind of courageous on their side saying that 
maybe the best way for those brands to succeed is, is not within the group. And, and it's probably with the management in place that we trust. Hence, the decision they made to sell the companies and the decision they made to sell the company to um, the management in place. So various numbers have been published. Some have guessed that the loss of value at UN and GP was from the purchase of GP in 2011 and UN in 2014 to the sale in 2022. The loss of value was as high as 80 to 90% of the pre-purchase companies. How do you recover from that from a management standpoint? Uh, it seems like now you've lost the resources of the larger group. Um, was there any kind of parting cash infusion or a dowry, so to speak, as you departed on your own to try to recover from some of those losses? I think, you know, and um, I was not there when Kering bought the comp two companies. I mean, for UN, I joined end of 2016. The company had been acquired mid-2014. So, um, and ob obviously, I'm, I, I don't want to disclose, you know, numbers that, oh, no, no, that, I that I might not know, but for sure, what I know is they, they put us in a position to succeed. Um, it's not the first time that Kering uh, are doing it. Actually, it's a second time. They did it with uh, La Redoute. So prior being Kering, Kering was PPR, Pini Printer Redoute, Pinot Printer Redoute. It was like a distribution company. And, and they had La Redoute. So they sold it again to the management. And La Redoute has been really successful in, in France as an as a online distribution uh, company. So I think they, they realized the same, that the best chance of success for UNNGP was to become independent. And, and, and being under the, the ownership of the management, they gave us the means also to succeed. So what does it mean? Um, brand equity matters, not revenue. Brand equity matters, not increasing production. Um, brand equity matters, not spending millions, you know, with, with marketing bullshit. So what I mean by that is they, they gave us um, the means to, to clean the market for the excess inventory, to be able to have the right size in terms of distribution network. We used to have 680 points of sale. Now we have about 280. We are working with the best dealers on the planet. Um, we've revamped pretty much completely the product portfolio. So I think beyond the numbers, the foundation of UN have never been that strong that today. So it's safe to say that because Caring was more of a distribution-oriented kind of luxury brand group and UN and GP were more manufacturing-oriented, maybe the mismatch was just one of culture and focus. Yes, it's a, it's a kind of French company. Uh, you've got a lot of, you know, Italian executive also in the company. We are, you know, a bit lost. It's, we are Swiss, half Swiss, French. Uh, for the management, we are kind of lost in the Jura mountain. So yes, it, it, it's a bit of a, of, of a different world. I do believe that uh, the Pinot family have a passion for watches. They really like watches. But at the end of the day, they are also, you know, businessmen, business owners. And they said to ourselves, okay, maybe the best way for those brands to succeed. And they're really, for them, the fact that we do succeed when exiting and after exiting, you know, the group yes. is highly important for them. So now moving on from the sale, you talked about first fewer but better vendors, which was part of kind of the, the separation from caring, closing doors that weren't necessarily productive or didn't give you enough case space or weren't sufficiently interested in the brand or committed, and also buying up inventory to take some control of your aftermarket so there weren't too many watches available for too little money on the secondary uh, exchanges. <clears throat> Is that pretty much an accurate assessment of what you did immediately after going independent? Definitely. It means that, you know, when you go from 680 point of sale to 280 wholesale, pretty much I think in 90% of the cases, we bought back inventory. So it's millions and millions and millions of Swiss franc basically of, of, at cost. Um, and, and we also try to, because some of that inventory put as almost new on the secondary market by untrustworthy retailers, like gray, uh, gray market watches. Gray market watches. We had to do something about it also. So we kind of tried to clean ourselves, uh, the market, to that perspective. So, and we, we kind of also, I mean, if you think about, I don't know, a platform like Chrono24, we used yes. to have 
three years ago, something like 6,500 or 7,000 new watches listed, whether they were available or not. I believe today it's less, less than half. We also send, you know, um, we've been active legally to basically, you know, when people were falsely promoting watches uh, at a certain price and not the watch is not being available and so on. So we did, I mean, I think I, I've signed maybe 50 or 60 different lawyers later <laughs> to, to basically to, to, to those guys who, 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 who do harm the brand. Um, so we've been very active on that, definitely. It's not the only component which is necessary, but I think it's, 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 it, it's, it's a decent portion of, of what needs to be done um, in order to, to wipe the slate clean in a way. Now, I think when you talk about brand equity, taking control of your aftermarket is a big part of that. It's also something that I, as a buyer, would want to see. If I know I can get the same watch gray market for 40% less, why wouldn't I pay that? So really going in there and sort of taking control of your destiny in the secondary mm -hmm. market is, is really big for people who buy these watches. I've always wondered when a manufacturer buys back inventory, what happens to those watches? <laughs> no comment? No, no, no. Uh, look, there is, there is, there is different ways. I think one one way is, and we try to do that as much as possible, is to disassemble the watch. Um, so, for instance, what we've done is, you've got a watch, let's say a rose gold case, uh, movement that we know we can reuse. So we're going to basically reuse the movement as such. Uh, we, we melt also the gold for, let's say, a collection which is no longer in use. So we've done that quite a bit. Uh, we also sometimes, if the movement doesn't work properly, we, dis, we, we, we disassemble the watch movement and go back to the spare part level. Okay. Um, and I think for the vast majority of the watches, this is what we've done. Now, you've expressed your admiration for Patek, Philippe, and Rolex and the way they control their markets and they manage their brands. And they actually have one important similarity to how uh, your sales model works, which is that they generally don't work through company-owned boutiques. They generally work through third-party dealers. And of the roughly 270, 280 doors you have right now, maybe five, six, seven, or you lease Nardin mono brand boutiques. Why have you chosen independent retailers as your platform? And are there places where mono brand works? Mono brands for you when the exception is China, um, because I think the Chinese consumer always fear to buy fake products, whether it's watches, whether it's, you know, um, um, leather goods and so on. So that's why you've got a lot of mono brands boutiques uh, in China. And two, you don't have a lot of qualitative uh, wholesale multi-brand in China, as a matter of fact. So uh, obviously when we, we wanted, and I wanted to develop a, a strong domestic Chinese market because it's one third uh, the Chinese uh, um, um, for the consumption of luxury goods, um, I had to open mono brands boutique, you know, whether they were direct, whether they are opening with a with franchisee partner. For the rest of the world, I mean, the two biggest and most desired watch brand on the planet, you name them, are wholesale. And they believe in wholesale relationship and wholesale partners. And I believe, even as a consumer and as a collector, I do like to shop pre-owned. I do like to shop new, but I like to be in a multi-brand environment. And I think the role of the retailer, our role, my role is to manufacture the best watch is possible for you. And uh, the role of our partners is to create the best customer experience and to sell my product, right? Um, we say we have two different jobs. And at the end of the day, especially that the mission is to recruit new consumer, to recruit new generation of consumer, younger consumer, fuel the passion of watchmaking. I think you can only probably do it when you've got choices when you can compare you know, one brand to another, one product to another. That's the way you can basically tell stories. And that makes sense. And it also makes sense, like you said, when introducing the brand to new customers, it helps to have a partner that's well established with the clientele locally. Like I think you have a, is it a joint venture with Siddiqui in the Middle East? That's your largest global retail point of sale. And you know, it's, it's between you and Siddiqui, it's not a UN factory owned store, but it is your most productive vendor. 
Yeah, yes. So it's one of the most, one of the most. I, I think, you know, we, we're very close to, um, and I value very much you know, the management and what they do. Sediki, Watch the Season, um, The Hourglass in Southeast Asia, uh, Vempe also based in, in, in Germany, um, and, uh, and also Booker. So I think those, those five are really, I would say, anchor. Retailer first. Well established. Well established. And, and, and we share also the, the same values and, and, and very long term, long term plan together. So we do work very well with them. They are supporting us. We also try to bring value to the table. Uh, it's not one way. Uh, and that's the way I'm seeing it. Obviously, we're not only focusing on them. We do want to work with the local champions, you know, the, the yes. best independent retailer in every single country, especially in North America, um, where you do have highly qualitative, independent, or you know, um, um, privately owned uh, retailers too. Now, there is a difference between the, the point of sale and distribution. Wholesale distribution, it's, it's important for a brand to control its regional distribution to retailers. You do control your regional distributors. That is you, Lisa Nardin. Absolutely. Uh, we kind of, in, in, in the last seven years, I kind of cut pretty much all the distributors, so market where we used to go uh, to have somebody in between the retailer and, and the brand. That is almost no longer the case. So if you think about the US, for instance, we've got our subsidiary in, uh, in Boca Raton. Uh, the team is over there. We've got um, eight watchmakers. We do service the watches. So we, yeah, we, we do operate the market, especially the biggest market, uh, directly. Now, it's important you mention that, the watchmakers in a local market. That's really interesting to me because we're going to move on to differentiation in a second now. But the worst part of owning a luxury watch is after sales service. It's expensive. It's slow. There's no communication. You have very few options for watches that are specialized. Mm -hmm. What are you doing at Ulysse Snarden to make service less painful for customers? Having watchmaker uh, on the market. That's the main thing. Um, obviously, we try to train them as much as possible for them to be able, obviously, they all uh, literate on the one weight A caliber. Um, also, on our two beyonds, uh, a Freak X also can be repaired. Now, we are currently training, for instance, the watchmaker on the Freak 1. Um, really, the top end has to go back to the manufacturer. So, charming pieces, repeaters, a Freak, uh, S. A freak S definitely has to go back to the lock. But apart from that, the rest is can be serviced in the US. And, and that's the way I think now the lead time for a, a simple movement um, is, is about within four weeks. So it's, it's quite rapid, uh, quite fast. And, um, and obviously, we've got quite a low uh, return on, on, on our manufacturing movement, which are many, most of the movement that we have currently in production. So I believe, um, if I'm not mistaken, for a 118 caliber, which is your standard order now? Yes, we are. We are the same return rate as Rex. Excellent. So if you have a blast tourbillon, you can have that serviced locally in the United States. Yep. It doesn't have to go back to Switzerland. Absolutely. Gets done domestically, returns to you. Absolutely. So now you've got two brands, and the management team of Ulysse Narden owns both GP and UN. And if you ever choose to bring it back, Jean Richard. So how do you differentiate? Because again, we talked about rumors at the introduction. But there's a lot of rumor online that it's now all one shop, one factory. There's no differentiation. You have one bench that's doing GP and UN. It's all really one company now. You know, the old factories have been combined. I understand that business offices, things like marketing and HR, that makes <coughs> sense to combine. But how do you keep the brands differentiated and the creative and production teams unique? Not even the marketing. So, you know, when we became independent, we had that image of, you know, the Great Wall in China. And that Great Wall will be made for separating UN and GP as much as possible. We want the two brands to remain really independent from a creative perspective, from a product creation perspective, from a marketing perspective, even from a sales and distribution perspective. The UN team um, in the US, for instance, in Boca Raton, has nothing to do with the GP team. We share the same office. But, but we are completely different. Obviously, there is a, um, an executive committee where you have both people from UN and GP. But apart from that, uh, we share the minimum. Um, to give you an idea, we do have on a monthly basis product committee where we work on, on, on the future 
uh, development, you never had somebody from GP joining those meetings and, and, and it will never be the case. So it's fully separated and, and what's joined, it's what makes sense. So definitely shared services, finance, HR. We do have a chief industrial officer running the two brands. Um, so through that, if you visit La Chaux-de-Fonds, the building, the manufacturer, where you used to have only the, the UN logo, now you've got the GP, GP logo next to it. Uh, but if you go inside, you will see that most of the time uh, it can be different people working on the two brands and for sure two different movements. So it's not just like you go to ETA and that's Longine and that's Tiso and that's Omega. You know, it's, it's dedicated production, uh, brainstorming and design, uh, dedicated movements for the brands to the extent that's possible. Um, so they're going to stay differentiated. We're not going to become uh, Vaucher for Richemont. That's right. a very good way of putting it. So now in terms of the brands, a lot of people would say the GP and UN seem to be similar in price point, the type of customer they appeal to, the type of watch they make, even approximately relative volumes. So they seem like they're both brands for like watch nerds, highly cultivated people who have many watches already. They're rarely a first watch. How do you avoid appealing to the same guy and blurring the lines between the two from a marketing and image standpoint? A Laureato has nothing to do with a freak and a freak has nothing to do with a Laureato. Uh, I don't want to, to, to sum up GP on a Laureato or to sum up UN on, on freak because there is, there is much more to tell, but I think the, the, the design identity, it's, it's, it's different. The story of the companies are different. Yes, I mean, speaking about UN, it's not your first watch. So we do, we do attract collectors that are already savvy, who have already some, some watches. Having said that, um, and I think I was taking the, the image of, uh, of ice creams, right? So if, uh, if GP maybe was an ice cream, it would be, I think, a beautiful, dedicated um, vanilla taste. Uh, if, if UN was an ice cream, passion fruit. Big time. With not, not chocolate. You go all the way. <laughs> exotic. No, no. And, and food of flavor, you know. And, and I think I'm taking that example because we also attract, and I've seen that in the last four or five years, really new and actually much younger consumer. I'm, I'm not obsessed by selling the watches to, to, to younger clients, to young clients. But as a matter of fact, we attract younger consumers. And I'm going to give you a, an example. Uh, I was in China a couple of months ago. I was in uh, Shenzhen, which is not far from Hong Kong. <clears throat> and I met, uh, I wanted to meet um, customers that recently bought UN. And I met a gentleman, uh, he is um, 18, 18. And he bought a diver uh, skeleton X, so the skeleton diver um, azure, the one which is yes. blue. And I said to him, why? Uh, so I said to him, yeah, how did you end up buying UN? Why this one? You know, how many watches do you have in his collection? And that watch is his third watch. He had, I think, a Rolex. He had, actually he had two Rolexes and then the UN. And he said to me, I bought that because I want, I want to feel different. I just want to wear some things that I like and that I'm not going to see on the wrist of everyone. And, and for him, the, the product design, and, and, and also because obviously he, he did not go for a freak yet, what freak expresses and what UN expresses, you know, it's taking risk, it's, um, it's, it's being independent, free spirit, um, um, cutting edge, definitely trying to, to live to, or to open a route that, that nobody else has taken before. So kind of taking your destiny in your own hands that reflects a lot toward younger consumer and especially entrepreneurs. So another example, I've done a, a dinner in Singapore. I'm 37 years old and I've done that dinner, I think something like six months ago. And um, there were 10 clients, 10 collectors. Believe me or not, I was by far the oldest. But the that's good though, they're the future. The youngest one was uh, 16, he came with his mom, and they all almost pretty much had purchased a freak. I think two thirds were entrepreneurs, small, medium-sized business owners, 
And if they were on the corporate side, they had already climbed the corporate ladder quite rapidly. So definitely, I think people who are really driven to make a difference. And, and I think that is fairly new for us, you know, as a consumer within the past two to three years. Okay, so now before we jump over to the product mm -hmm. side, where we'll focus a little bit more on the watches themselves, I just want to ask you this, and it's a very subjective question, but the turnaround is now your goal, rebuilding the brand, uh, bringing it back to a position of strength. When and how will we know that the turnaround has succeeded? When I will attend a, a dinner with clients and more than half are rain freaks. Whether it's, you know, new, vintage, I'm still doing, you know, a lot of customer dinner where I'm still introducing the freak. But there I will attend those dinners and I will see, you know, among 10 clients, five, six freaks on the wrist. That means success to me. You know, something else we spoke about before we came on really comes back to me and it really struck me when you said, I want to see markets that reflect honest value. I want someone to know that the watch is not going to lose 40% of its value when you leave the dealer, that the price you see new and the price you see on like a Chrono 24 is going to be more or less the same. So not an undersupplied market or an oversupplied market, but properly supplied with stable representative pricing. Yes. What, what matters to me, I mean, if you want to, to make money, don't buy UN. Um, if you want to, to buy a watch, to leave it in a safe and, you know, flip it after six months or one year, don't buy UN. And this was launched uh, a year and a half ago, right, FreeCast? Yes. None of them appeared on the secondary market. This, what matters to me, is because it ends up on the wrist of the right consumer. Having said that, what I want to be in a position to, to say to the consumer, to the collector, is to say, you know what? You buy that for you, you enjoy it, you take good care of it, and we never know what's happening in life. You know, if five, six years down the line, you want to, to sell it back to, let's say, a consumer at market price, I want you to be able to get your money back or very minimal loss. Obviously, if you go through a middle person who will trade in your watch, obviously they will take the margin, but I'm talking about the market price, five, six years down the line, it has to be very close to what the customer paid for. And I think a lot of watch owners would agree with that notion that a watch isn't a money maker. It's something that's fun, that is a better store of value in the sense that it's enjoyable than, say, bonds or cash in the bank. All these things are stores of value, but they're not fun. You can't wear your bonds on your wrist. You can't carry your cash with you. Your watch is simultaneously a statement of personal taste, expression, fun, a basis for community with other collectors, but it's also going to stay true to value. And I think that's a great way to look at it. It's not a money-making enterprise. Maybe for the manufacturer it is, but not for the owner. And that's a good way to look Absolutely. at it. Absolutely. So now, as we move forward, I think the interesting thing about UN's product is just how much it's changed. We went from rebuilding the brand in the 80s under Rolf Schneider to great innovations with Rolf and Ludwig and Pierre in the 90s to uh, you know reaching higher levels of volume, now approaching 25,000 a year during the 2000s. And then the 2010s was all about the integration with caring. So through a lot of that pre-caring period, a big driver of UN's volume and image and designs was frankly the Russian market and Eastern European buyers who wanted watches that were very big and colored gold and often a little bit awkward and idiosyncratic. Mm -hmm. So how have you drawn UN watch design away from that sort of uh, philosophy towards the watches you're making now? Like how have you designed watches that are also for the rest of the world? You know, with, with what happened a couple of years ago in, in, in Ukraine. Um, and we're talking about Crimea in 2014, the initial yes. sanctions. And, and obviously, I mean, if we wouldn't have changed the focus on all the markets and also refined the design of the product, with what happened a couple of years ago, honestly, we would have gone bankrupt because of the weight of Eastern Europe, you know, X URISS block. I'm talking about, you know, it's a 350 million um, 
people region. I mean, we were definitely very strong there. We still have a you know strong awareness, but when I joined the company in 2016, the really the priority by far was to build a strong U.S. domestic market, Chinese domestic market, and um, building a strong presence and awareness in Southeast Asia, Singapore, Malaysia, Thailand, and so on. So <clears throat> what for sure we refuse to do is to develop a product for a specific market. Um, meaning that, yes, to some extent, you know, a, a freak one in 44 mil, a freak S <clears throat> in 45 mil um, is not the ga- be the base sizing for, for Chinese tourist. But it doesn't matter because first, we don't produce that many watches. And two, we have to be very true to the, to the UN identity. So talking about, obviously, the, the, the product design, I think what happened in the last even seven years, Freak used to be a monoproduct. You didn't have Freak X. You didn't have Freak 1. You didn't have Freak S. You didn't have Blast. Um, the Diver was a different watch. Um, and if you think about also the Marine, maybe we had just launched you know, the Marine top here, but it used to be the Marine much more chunky, um, you know, heavy. Big integrated lugs. Uh, absolutely. So in fact, all of that from a product perspective is gone. And so I think we made a, and really, I would say kudos to, to, my, to my product team because I think we've done a great job. Having said that, it doesn't mean that we're going to rest <laughs> on, on where we are today. And, and there is clearly a direction of keep refining more the product uh, in, in the finishing, um, improving also the contrast also on the dial. Um, I, I believe I heard from someone that, um, you know, Stern, his main focuses were on two things. The movement, he wanted to make the slimmest movement possible because he knew after that he was be able to, to have basically the best proportion of the watch afterwards when you, you've got a thin movement. And it was a dial because dial also means value perception is what is seen. So that is going to be even more... Uh, a point of attention to me going forward, uh, sizing slightly smaller, design, we want to make sure that this design lasts. So to some extent, slightly more classic, as opposed to, you know, very much in your face in terms of design. Yeah. More I, Sonata than Sonata Streamline, in other words. Absolutely. So now it, it is interesting, because I can see this principle in practice here. I've got the Freak One, which was a GPHG laureate last year, so congratulations for that. <clears throat> it's 44 millimeters, which is smaller than the previous case size by a millimeter, but it's 12 millimeters thick, and for me that's really the key. This is about as thick as something like a Daytona, which no one would consider to be a thick watch. I don't remember the Ulysse Narden of 10 years ago being a watch I would describe as thin. This is. You know, the story behind the Freak One, so that has been launched last year in April in, in Geneva, so less than a year ago. <clears throat> we were supposed to launch that product three years ago. And um, why we did not launch it three years ago is initially it was supposed to be the case of the free case. Which is a bigger watch. Which is a bigger watch and which I absolutely love everything about this watch, but it's free case. You've got literally a spaceship in the watch. Um, as a movement, it's, it's, it's perfect for this one, but it's not the right case for this one. So I remember a discussion we had in one of that product committee and we said, okay, I said, if we were to launch this one in, 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 in that case, we are not launching it. And we had a discussion, yes, but Mathieu is like, uh, and, and I wanted to reduce the size. This 45, we wanted to be 44 or even south of 44, but obviously it's a challenge because if you have the, you know, the puck construction of the freak, like the, the, the no crown freak, the whole movement, obviously you don't want it to be too small because it's, you need to leave space for the watch, but there is really challenges with the movement. And we went to a point that maybe we had to stop the project as it was at the beginning and re-engineer completely the movement. And that would have been potentially four or five years down the line. So. But they managed financially, we managed to reduce the size by one millimeter to, to slim us, the, to, 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 to make the case slimmer, to work on a simple variation of, of, of the case. And then the second point was, could we do that watch on a integrated rubber strap? 
And then obviously the first answer was absolutely no. <laughs> you ask too much. First, it's smaller, thinner, but it's going to be a challenge also to make it integrated. And in the end, they managed to do it. So just to explain to you, you know, the, the background conversation we had in order to get to that product. So a lot of work went into this, and it's <clears throat> fascinating to me because the Freak was always one of a number of models in the catalog, but also sort of an orphan within the Ulysse Nardin collection. Now, Range Rover is now Range Rover. There's the Velar, there's the Range Rover Evoque. It's an entire brand within a brand, and so is the Freak. You have the Freak X with the crown. You have the Freak One, which is more of a traditional bezel setting, a case back winding, locking bezel type of Freak. And then you've got the flagship with the Freak S at the top. Uh, talk about the importance of the Freak to you, Lise Nardin, because it's no longer sort of a halo model. It's sort of your core model line. It is. Um, obviously, I love all, all the collection we have, but if there is one product with the most distinctive story and the most distinctive design at UN, it's a Freak. So back in 2016, 2017, we said, OK, how are we going to be able to, to tell the Freak story? <clears throat> and when you have you know, only one product, you become a bit dry. So we, we had that you know, vision of saying free has to become a collection. But obviously, it's not like you're going to be able to verticalize. You're not going to put a perpetual calendar in a freak. You're not going to put a, a charming movement in a freak. It's, it's basically the movement that tells the time. So I think with X, 1, and S, and I'm, I'm happy also to say to, to the audience that those three movements are here to stay. So there are really three product category in the freak that will remain. Uh, we have no intention to do more. There might be more on top of freak S at some point with kind of a concept watches or something very, very old orlogerie, but X, 1, and S are to remain. And honestly, one of the most product that has been talked about was when we launched FreakX back in 2019. And yeah, we had Puri saying that you are killing the Freak. Obviously, they had not yet the picture of having yet, yeah, but that's going to become a collection. Uh, we did not fully know yet what we wanted to do also on the same side. So we didn't have fully all yet one and S. So, and at the end of the day, I'm very proud of that because if you want to tell the story, you have to be, you have to, to have a more accessible product. And so we've got all three of them here. We've got we've got the Freak X, we've got the Freak One, we've got the Freak yes. S. And 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 the X, you know, is is I mean, that's a real deal. That's a freak. That's a no crown. That's the entry to freak. So you, you've got already a lot of flavor about uh, about the freak. Um, it's a hybrid movement of the 118 caliber and and a kind of a carousel uh, yes. module. And therefore, it, it, it... So it's essentially, it's a conventional center rotor automatic attached to a carousel. Absolutely. And therefore, it makes uh, we have the possibility to make it smaller also. So it's a very versatile, it's something that I wear every day. Um, it's also slightly more understated, slightly more classic, I must say, as a design as a Freak 1 or Freak S. And, uh, and yes, uh, you know, when we launched it in uh, 2019, uh, I was at the uh, SIHH, so previously, uh, you know, before Watches and Wonders, and I met uh, one of the senior designers at Diego Lecoult, a former colleague of mine, and I had that one on the wrist, and he said, oh, can I see it? And, and what he did was, he did not look at the face of the watch. He looked at the watch on the side, and he said to me, I absolutely love the shape of the watch. And I think it's, it's, it's something also that I love about the free case is I, I absolutely love the design from each angle. And it is the most organically shaped case. It, it's got curves. It's got sort of a sinuous grace to it. Uh, but then when you move to the Freak 1, this is really, this is like a full fat Freak. You've got case back winding. You've got bezel setting. You've got the traditional bezel lockdown at the foot of the dial. Um, so the price delta here, you can get a Freak X for about 35,000 US dollars to get into a Freak 1. Now you're talking about 70, 75,000. Yeah. And then the Freak S is going to be about twice that. It's going to be in the 140 range. Uh, so when we talk about this being basically a center rotor automatic attached to a carousel, this is the grinder. This is Ulysse Nardin's own automatic system. It's very efficient, also very compact. 
And I would say it's more of a hybrid of a peripheral rotor with a conventional center rotor automatic, because it's definitely not hinged over the center. It rotates around a donut hole, so to speak. Yes, I mean, I, I think you're absolutely right. It is, so it is the most effective automatic winding system on the market today. Um, if we wanted to power the Freak 1 or the Freak S with a regular rotor, it wouldn't work. It would not basically bring enough power. And, and, and the way, as you said, it's working, you've got that huge wheel with a lot of teeth on it. You've got those four very sensitive levers uh, at you know, 90 degrees. Yes. And as soon as you move, it's very sensitive, they will engage one more teeth. So it's a bit like if you were on a bike with you know, two pedals and four legs. It's, it's pretty much the same principle. And I believe because we patented the grinder um, about six years ago, so in 14 years, that patent will go public. That could become the future, like the silicone has been uh, for the escapement. The grinder could be the future of automatic winding system when it will become public. That's an exciting prospect. In the short run, I noticed that these are very elaborate watches, even the most basic. This is still quite a bit of sophistication between automatic winding, a three-day power reserve, and a carousel. And it just seems to fit with the trend we're seeing now. This is like a, a matter of the present day being the era of fewer watches at higher price points, and it's called premiumization. Is this something you've seen at Ulysse Narden where it's been fewer but more expensive watches as the market adapts? Definitely. We've seen that, I would say, already <clears throat> maybe four years ago. Um, and, I, and actually, in, in terms of demand, we see pretty much as much demand today, if it's not more, on a free case than basically a watch that costs, you know, uh, three times less. So we definitely see that evolving. And I believe where we see the most dynamic is going to be between, you know, 30,000 US dollar to, to 100 plus. Um, I mean, and even if you look at the Swiss export, you know, the, for, for the watches, you see that anything above Yes, yeah, 30, 40,000 uh, have been increasing a lot. So I think there is definitely a demand over there. And as far as UN in concern, definitely. Our reservation price has grown quite a bit over the, over the past three to four years. And I believe that will, will continue a bit. And I can easily see like a progression of the kind of person who buys this just based on uh, the veterancy of the collector and budget point. I can see a person who's maybe into Chagere Lecoult getting involved in the Freak X, somebody who's maybe a little bit more involved in something like an Urverk UR100 or UR105 getting into a Freak 1, and then the person who's more of a Grubel 4C, Debatoon, high-end you know, high Urverk customer buying something like a UR220, that person's going to get into the, the Freak S. And, you know, if you make less than 10,000 watches a year, about 1,000 are Freaks, still only 75 are going to be the Freak S, and that's over several model years. So that is kind of Grubel 4C, Debatoon volume. It is. It is indeed. And I think going forward, you know, we, we don't intend to, um, to grow that much in terms of volume going forward. So as I said at the beginning, you know, what matters is the brand equity. And therefore, we are, we are very cautious on increasing production. And I am very protective about, about the freak. I can definitely understand that. So it's kind of interesting because that, that plays to your Urverk, MBNF, Grubel 4C, Debatoon type guy. Mm -hmm. But you do have an enormous range of pricing. You can get into a Marine Topia for $9,100. And then the Mega Yacht, depending on which version you get, could be almost $400,000. Mm -hmm. Is it possible for these to coexist in the same catalog? Or are you going to need a junior brand down the line like a Tudor or a Jean Richard? I think as much as I think that you can't ride too many horses at the same time, right? If you want to do things properly, I also know from where it's coming from UN. And UN was even more extreme before because it was selling watches at 5,000 US dollar, you know, divers, marines, and selling the Genghis Khan uh, or, you know, the Imperial Blue at basically three quarters of a million. So I think now we, we kind of more like with intent to, we do have watches at 300, so maybe 10 to 150. It's, it's already quite a, quite a reduced uh, bracket. Um, I think below 10,000 is not for UN. 
um, going forward. Obviously, we need to we need to bring and keep bringing even more value in our product uh, with a new development. But for me, the core probably segment is going to be between you know ten to ten to one hundred as a as a focus. But we will always remain very innovative and and making some I would say new um, few development on the auto luxury. So you might see, for instance, on the free, but on all the collections, sometimes product that will be launching at 250, 300, but very, very limited quantities. Some of the watchmakers and engineers and concept specialists who've been part of Ulysse Nard and product design are like modern day rock stars. And so a lot of people are wondering, who is currently leading product development at Ulysse Nard and is, is the rumor that Ludwig is back true? So, you have good, uh, good sources of information. <laughs> the Jean-Christophe Sabatier joined the company six months or nine months before me at the beginning of 2016. So um, he's, uh, he's basically chief product officer uh, and he's, uh, he's, he's leading the product development. And he's basically the person in his team are, are the people behind what you see here. And uh, yes, Ludwig is back. Happy to hear that. Very excited to hear that. And it does take a long time to design a watch from scratch. Now, you've overseen a couple of product cycles because you've been there since 2016. But when can we expect to see the watches that are solely products of the new management, which again has only been in place since 2022? When can we expect to see the watches that have only come about from the concept to production under independent ownership? So independent, but actually it's the same management. So, I mean, if you think about the management team that we have today, uh, that are obviously part and leading that uh, management by out, pretty much everyone was here five, six years ago. So it's really the same team, but if you really want to see, I would say the kind of a new development initiated during the, the, the independency era, uh, the first product that you will see will be as of 2025. Now, I know I'm not going to get anything out of you, but if you can't tell me what we can expect to see from you, Lee Snarden, this year, could you at least let me know roughly when we can expect to see it? Freak, in two months' time, April, what is in wonder. All right, and if people want to find you, where do they find you? Myself? Oh, no, social media, the internet, retail points. Where do they go to actually see or learn about these watches? So, website, you know, elisnarden.com. Uh, obviously, Instagram. Um, I want to be more active on YouTube, also for 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 this Nana. I believe I believe in the long format video, and uh, obviously, you know, retail stores. So I mean, you can go on the website and see that where we are. I mean, if we think about the US, you know, we are in all the main cities, working with with I believe some of the best retail partners. Are you active on social media? Yes, we are. Uh, we're going to be even more. Uh, so uh, obviously, the IG of uh, of, of Ulysse Nardin. Uh, I mean, for myself, also being at the helm of the company, I'm personally also very much more involved on Instagram. So you know, the Mathieu Avalon, you will find me on on, on Instagram. Happy to answer, you know, everyone. Um, um, we have to be very close to the consumer, even though we sell through wholesale. Being independent means that the consumer and the collector needs to feel connected with the company and with the people behind the company. So, and I think social media is a good enabler. So like I said at the beginning, you can go straight to the source, find this guy on social media and start a conversation. Matthew, thank you so much. Tim, thank you so much.